Good morning or good afternoon and thanks for joining this lecture. I wish I had the opportunity to meet you in person in Trento. This was the initial plan with uh, Professor Belloni, but as you all know, the circumstances decided otherwise, and sadly, this will have to be a recorded lecture. Something that I'm not very experienced with, so please bear with me in case there is any IT problem. It is too bad that I cannot be uh, present in the classroom with you, but every cloud has a silver lining, because I think that this uh, COVID-19 crisis shows more forcefully than anything else how important it is to build resilient societies and uh, project this resilience across the borders of the European Union and NATO member states. This is what this lecture will be focusing on. I will be showing you some PowerPoint slides, which may help guide the structure of the analysis, but every now and then I will also try and uh, be present with my own video. Here I can show it to you. There isn't too much to see. As you can see, I could not join you in Trento because I am myself on lockdown in Florence but I will try and make the most of it, this opportunity. And uh, as you can see here, there is my email. So in case there is any question, any follow-up that you have from this lecture, please do not hesitate to get in touch with me. Let me just introduce myself before I introduce the subject and tell you something about why I was chosen as a guest lecturer in Professor Belloni's course. I, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands and uh, in my career, throughout my career as a scholar of security studies, I had the opportunity to work with several uh, policy institutions including the NATO Center of Excellence on Civil Military Cooperation that is based in The Hague in the Netherlands. And among the projects that I led there was this one on projecting resilience across the Mediterranean, which was later published as a book by Palgrave Macmillan. The reason why the NATO Center of Excellence on CIMIC, on Civil Military Cooperation, asked me to write this book is that resilience has indeed become the new catchword in Euro-Atlantic security circles, in Brussels, in Washington, and in other NATO capitals. Why is it the case that resilience, this concept that has in fact been uh, often criticized as a uh, fussy and ill designed, has now become the new light motive of uh, European and North American foreign and security policies? This is the reason I wrote this book. This is the very reason this book was uh, asked to me as uh, the output of the research project that I mentioned. And this is what this lecture will be focusing on. Just to give you an example of how frequent the notion of resilience has become, let me, let me tell you a little joke. I had the occasion as a consultant for the NATO CIMIC Center of Excellence and other institutions to often participate in uh, policymakers' conferences. And in one of them at the European Union Hybrid Threats Center of Excellence in Helsinki, I started with a joke, something that had occurred to me in previous conferences. If we were to play a drinking game using the word resilience as one of those instances when one has to take a shot and drink, well, the result would be, I believe, a terrible hangover. And you can clearly see what I mean here. In the NATO Warsaw Summit Communique, a relatively short document that summarizes the outcome of the NATO Summit of 2016, the word resilience is mentioned 11 times and is considered as the basis for credible deterrence and the fulfillment of the Alliance's core task. The European Global Strategy, also published in 2016, on the other hand, well, that would be a guaranteed hangover because the word resilience is mentioned 41 times and is elected as the main objective of European Union external action. 
So let me just uh, guide you through the structure of this lecture and tell you what we will be focusing on in the remaining half an hour or so. First of all, we will be having a look at what the concept of resilience is, how this concept has been borrowed from other domain into international politics, how resilience is conceptualized in NATO doctrine, and how resilience is uh, seen and uh, possibly being used as the guided principle of European Union external action. Second, we will be focusing on why this turn to resilience has occurred. And third, we will be looking at what are the implications of this resilience term? What does it mean in practice for European Union policies and European Union member states policies towards countries in the neighborhood and more specifically in the southern and eastern Mediterranean? Let's start with the concept of resilience. Resilience is a word you can easily look at into any dictionary in Italian, in English, and it basically means, according to physics and engineering, the property of materials that are capable of bending but not breaking, of absorbing external shocks without getting permanently damaged. This is the original meaning of the word that has, however, increasingly spawned across different domains, such as psychiatry, for instance. According to psychiatry, resilience is the ability of individuals to cope with traumatic experiences. Again, like materials, individuals too can cope with external stresses without getting permanently damaged, so to say, and therefore elaborate traumas. But how about international relations? Here, the problem is a little more thorny, because as it often is in the field of international politics, concepts do not really have a very precise objective meanings. Indeed, their meaning might depend depending on the people of, or organizations that are using certain concepts. So defining resilience here might need a little deeper effort. And let us start by looking at how the concept of resilience itself has entered the field of international politics. It is a concept that we have started to see primarily within the development community. So that, for instance, the effort to build resilience is mentioned in the UN Development Program of 2011, and later on, the national development agencies of the United Kingdom, the DFID, the Department for International Development, and the United States, USAD, also started using the concept of resilience. Uh, the European Union and NATO then adopted the concept slightly later, so that we already see the concept of resilience as the objective of one specific European Council uh, dedicated to the subject, which summarizes the European approach to resilience. And then we see the concept being uh, introduced within NATO jargon in the 2014 Wales Summit conclusions. But what is the meaning of resilience for each of these organizations, the European Union and NATO? Let us start with NATO. NATO defines resilience as a society's ability to resist and recover easily and quickly from shocks. The shocks are mentioned, and uh, examples of those are natural disasters, failures of critical infrastructure, or an armed attack. Just to give you an example, a uh, crisis like the current COVID-19 crisis could definitely be seen as one of those shocks. Resilience is basically, according to NATO, uh, an ability that combines both civil, civilian preparedness and uh, military capacity. And again, it is essential to NATO's collective security and defense. It is something that is considered to be crucial for NATO safety. Let us now look a little bit more how the concept of resilience is being used by NATO. Basically, NATO tried as a military organization, as a bureaucracy that needs some more specific guidelines in order to operate. As you know, military bureaucracies are not the most flexible. NATO has attempted to conceptualize resilience on the basis of seven baseline requirements. We have resilience when all of these requirements are fulfilled. These are the assured continuity of critical government services, the ability of governments to develop uh, key public services, starting from utilities, garbage collection, all that 
allows for a society to function uh, safely. Of course, that requires resilient energy supplies. It requires the ability to deal with uncontrolled movements of people. Here you can see how the concern for unregulated migration has entered the uh, concerns of NATO member states. Resilient food and water resources, the ability to deal with mass casualties, to make sure the casual that bodies, this gets a bit, a bit grim, but in the case of uh, some of the worst case scenarios, some of these contingencies that NATO has to deal with, such as, for instance, a nuclear attack, the possibility that large numbers of bodies have to be disposed of is unfortunately a sobering reality. There also need to be civil, resilient civil communication systems, such as, for instance, uh, safe and resilient cyberspace and resilient civil transportation systems. Now, this is not very important as such, but it is telling of what really NATO sees as resilience. As you can see, these features, these seven baseline requirements, really apply exclusively or mainly to advanced functioning societies like NATO members themselves. In fact, what we see is that NATO seems to apply the concept of resilience only to member states and their ability to recover from a major shock. States outside of NATO's community are not really seen as the targets of resilience projection efforts. This, of course, does not mean that NATO uh, does not see the stability of countries at its borders as unimportant. Quite the contrary, one of the main findings of the Warsaw Summit is that NATO, as of 2016, you know the story, the outcome of the Arab Springs, the civil war in uh, Syria and Libya, uh, the so-called migration crisis uh, looming at both uh, eastern and southern European borders. This created a growing awareness that NATO was surrounded by an arc of instability, a ring of fire. And NATO saw the need to ensure greater stability for the countries at its borders as crucial. But it did not refer to these efforts as the projection of resilience. In fact, the effort to strengthen countries outside NATO's border go under, goes under a different label. And that is the label of projecting stability. So for NATO, resilience and building resilience is something that focuses on NATO's own member states, while the efforts to stabilize third countries through military missions, capacity building, diplomatic efforts, is something that goes under a different label, the label of projecting stability. As of the EU definition, or the EU definitions, because in fact several European documents have mentioned resilience, and they have provided some more different definitions, the first definition that we found that in the European Council conclusions that I mentioned earlier, is that of resilience as the ability of an individual, a household, a community, a country to prepare for, withstand, adapt, and recover from stresses and shocks without compromising the long-term development prospects. Here you can see something that I mentioned earlier. The concept of resilience has entered international politics primarily through the venue of the development community. So it is a concept that still retains some legacy of uh, uh, development journey. In the 2016 European Global Strategy, on the other hand, resilience becomes the key light motive. As I told you already, it was mentioned 41 times. It is really the buzzword that occurs time and again in the document. This definition, however, is not entirely clear. You can see it from this quote here. Here, this is the closest to a proper definition of resilience. The global strategy refers to resilience as the ability of states and societies to reform, thus withstanding and recovering from internal and external crises. This is considered by the European Union as something that is in the interest of both European citizens and countries in our surrounding regions. Of course, this concept here remains somewhat vague. And in fact, you can see even greater vagueness in other definitions or mentions of resilience, such as this catchphrase here, 
that I thought about sharing with you, where resilience is referred to as basically the ability for societies to feel that they're becoming better off and have hope for a better future. The European Global Strategy, of course, is a programmatic document. It is a document that is meant to be read not only within the European Union, but also abroad. And as such, it contains an element of propaganda, if you will. The idea that, in fact, we are conducting these efforts to project resilience with a view to the greater good of not only European citizens themselves, but also the societies where resilience is being projected. As you can see from the geographic focus that is mentioned in the first definition, the East stretching into Central Asia and the South down to Central Africa, of course, there is a specific uh, uh, array of countries that are considered as the primary beneficiaries of European Union resilience projection efforts. And those, I'm sure we're familiar with them already, are countries within the European Union neighborhood. So countries of both the eastern neighbor and the southern neighbor, countries in the Maghreb, Middle East, and if we wanted to embrace a broader and large neighborhood perspective, also to a lesser extent, countries in the Sub-Saharan Africa and the Sahel region. Let us now discuss a little more about resilience projection efforts in the European neighborhood. And then, as I told you, let me remind you the structure once again, uh, discuss a little. Of course, it would be nicer to have a discussion with you and take some questions and have your own insights. Unfortunately, this is not possible, but let us try and have a bit of a discussion. I will be trying to present both sides of the debate here, a discussion on what resilience practically means, what are its bright sides as well as its downsides, and why resilience has indeed become such a buzzword, such a catchphrase in European Union uh, foreign and security policies. Starting from the European neighborhood policy, you can see here in this definition that strengthening the state and societal resilience of the European Union partners in the neighborhood is a key priority in the face of threats and pressures they are experiencing including the challenges associated with migration and mobility. Here you can see clearly that the time when the European neighborhood policy was revised, 2016, was also a time when irregular migration was at the very top of European citizens and European decision makers agenda. Hence, you can see that the ability to control unregulated migratory flows is seen as a fundamental component of states' resilience. So, just to conclude with uh, our definitional part and then move on into discussing why resilience and what are the implications of resilience, let us uh, uh, summarize what the European definition is and how it differs from NATO's. As you could see from the definitions that I presented, the European Union has a much broader understanding of resilience than NATO. And unlike NATO, the European Union also applies the concept of resilience to a larger array of geographical reference of uh, countries. In that resilience is seen by the EU as something that both European member states and third countries have to achieve. Something that is also interesting, and here I would have asked you a question and maybe discussed together with you why this is the case. The European Union no longer uses the concept of stability. For NATO, as you recall, projecting stability is the rubric that is used to refer to the efforts of strengthening countries outside of NATO's borders. The European Union doesn't do that. It projects resilience both outside of its borders and builds resilience inside of its own borders. But the concept of stability is basically missing. You can see that the word resilience in European jargon has now replaced the word stability. Let you, I mean, I will let you think about why, and maybe by the end of the lecture, the answer will look clear. If not, drop me an email. Why has this turn to resilience occurred in the first place? 
this may look like a puzzle because academics like me, you know, that we tend to be quite pedantic, have criticized the concept of resilience as fuzzy and ill-defined. However, the very word resilience and its usage in international politics has turned out to be quite resilient to all, quite resilient to all of this criticism. Why is it the case? In the book and in this lecture here, I made the case that this is primarily due to the fact that resilience serves as an ideal bridging concept. I will explain to you later what this means. Resilience basically serves as an ideal conceptual bridge between expectations and reality, between providers of reforms and local societies, between and within academic and policy communities, and between and within NATO and the European Union. Let us now go through each of these uh, bridges, so to say, in detail. First of all, resilience has become so successful because it epitomizes the zeitgeist, the spirit of the time, a time in which, after the disillusionment with the outcome of the era spring, the growing fear about irregular migration, the election of Donald Trump as US president, as well as the rise of populism within the European Union NATO countries, all of these trigger a new, more pessimistic mindset about the state of global politics. The optimism surrounding the possibility to promote democracy worldwide, ensure uh, development and uh, upholding human rights throughout the globe, that had already faded away. We were now, by the end of the first decade of the 2000s, in a situation when conflict and instability were seen as the new normal. So the turn to resilience reflects this uh, increasingly pessimistic mindset. Perhaps it reflects the reality check that decision makers and academics alike had to go through. The awareness that external shocks cannot really be anticipated. Of course, here, the COVID-19 crisis is the best example of all. This is a black swan, an unknown, unforeseen event that no one had anticipated. Of course, scholars had debated about the possibility that uh, the spreading of a pandemic disease could bring havoc within societies, but of course, no one could really tell when and the extent to which this crisis would have forced all of us to reconsider our lifestyles. So shocks cannot be anticipated. And this awareness is the outcome of the belief among scholars themselves that the world is perhaps too complex to be easily simplified and foreseen. Therefore, resilience departs from the belief that there is such a degree of ontological complexity in the way we, in the way our world is structured and there are such limitations, cognitive, structural, in the way we try to make sense of our world, that in fact, the very possibility to engage in large scale reforms of third countries, the possibility to engage in a broader transformative uh, campaign that would in fact guarantee global development, uh, the spread of democracy, and the upholding of human rights worldwide, well, that is something that the complexity of the world doesn't allow for. This is something that, in fact, could be discarded as a naive and ultimately impossible endeavor. So, resilience really is the outcome of this reality check. The world is too complex for us to understand, and the shocks that we're going to face cannot be anticipated in full. This reflects a second awareness, and that is that crises themselves due to the ontological complexity that I mentioned earlier, cannot be fully solved. It is foolish to think that uh, crises like uh, large-scale migration, crises like chronic underdevelopment in sub-Saharan Africa, instability, civil wars can be solved once and for all. We have tried and we have failed. So perhaps we have to settle for more modest objectives. Crisis cannot be solved, but only managed. It can be mitigated. Maybe the efforts of our decision makers should therefore be a little more modest and focus on trying to mitigate, to navigate this uncertainty 
as opposed to, once again, engage in broader democracy promotion campaigns, regime change, and so forth. Due to ontological complexity, the ability of countries like uh, the European Union members or the United States is inevitably limited. Here, of course, the lesson of Iraq and Afghanistan is very clear. Transforming other countries is something that European powers, that, or the United States for the matter, have repeatedly tried to do and failed. So perhaps these transformative uh, campaigns have to be relinquished and we need to settle once again for more modest objectives. While resilience stems from a more pessimistic mindset, perhaps, and this is what some scholars as well as some decision makers have argued, perhaps this is a healthy reality check. Perhaps we need to realize that it takes a more humility than we have previously engaged in. We need to realize that some more modest goals are perhaps the only viable foreign policy objectives because Striving for more grandiose uh, objectives is something that will inevitably only make the world around us worse off. The road to hell, as they say, is paved with good intentions. A second uh, aspect that might make the concept of resilience especially useful and therefore especially used in today's foreign policy communities is that it serves as a second conceptual bridge, a bridge between providers of reforms, like for instance, the development agencies or the foreign ministries of different European countries and recipients of reforms, the local communities to which those reforms are targeted. This is something that resilience can do. Since it builds on ontological complexity, resilience-based thinking understands and presupposes that in fact, there are no such things as one size fits all solutions. Again, the possibility of a template democracy promotion model that works worldwide is something that is discarded as uh, too naive to work out. As the European Union acknowledges, there are different paths to resilience. And in order for resilience to be built, there needs to be a focus on local ownership. That is, we need to bring local communities to our sides and have them on the driving seats when it comes to deciding, for instance, how the money of certain development projects is to be spent. And there needs to be cultural awareness. The European Union needs to steer clear of any patronizing uh, agendas and have local actors be able to adapt the European Union ideas for reform to their specific uh, cultural context. Local ownership is considered to be the holy grail of the development community. Now, it is understood that development projects are doomed to fail if the locals are not the first ones who are themselves convinced that those projects are worth uh, uh, conducting in the first place. But of course, and this is something that we may be looking at in the last part of the lecture, local ownership also entails some trade-offs and some ethical dilemmas that make such a ostensibly uh, easy to agree on objective, something that is in fact a little harder to achieve in practice. Third conceptual bridge that resilience serves us is that of a bridge between and within academic and policy communities. What do I mean by that? Resilience is something that exceeds the capabilities and the expertise of uh, foreign ministries, military organizations, and even the development community themselves. Building resilient society is something that requires the expertise of uh, academics from disciplines as diverse as the health sciences, agriculture, ecology, economics, and so forth. And therefore, the fact that resilience requires so many different uh, types of expertise make them turn it, turn the very concept of resilience into an opportunity for all those different communities to sit together and engage in a dialogue. The same happens with policy communities. Resilience offers a common terminology for policymakers working in different departments, working across the public and the private sector, consider NGOs as well as uh, transnational corporations in the extractive industry, for instance. 
consider uh, military organizations as well as uh, international organizations with a focus on the delivery of humanitarian aid, if all of them agreed that projecting resilience is an objective that is worth pursuing, then this very concept, resilience, serves as a bridge between different communities and offer a common objective for all of those different communities to work together. Last and perhaps most interesting, this slides do not move sometimes, resilience serves as a bridge between and within NATO and the European Union. It is no secret that both NATO and the European Union are increasingly strained alliances. And there are very many bones of contentions within each. But one that is especially relevant here is the increasing rift that has occurred between member states that consider security policies to be primarily directed at the East and therefore at deterring Russia, and member states, on the other hand, that consider the neglect for the South, for the Southern dimension of security policies as an unforgivable overlook. Basically, this divide reflects the geographic, uh, different geographic priorities of member states. European Union and NATO member states from Central and Eastern Europe, but also the United Kingdom and the United States, consider the deterrence of Russia to be the natural purpose of the North Atlantic Alliance, and to a lesser extent, something that the common foreign and security policy of the European Union should pursue as well. Members of the European Union from the South, starting from Italy, of course, but this also applies to Spain, Greece, Malta, and other countries, consider this objective, deterring Russia, as something that is entirely peripheral to their own security priorities. Russia is not seen as a threat in Italy. Migration, on the other hand, irregular migration, as well as the outbreak of conflicts and in the southern regions of the Mediterranean, consider Libya, consider Syria, the possibility for terrorists to enter the European Union, those are considered to be the key threats that an alliance like NATO and an international organization like the EU should be tackling. If you think about it, resilience is indeed a word that can be applied to both of these regions. Resilience is something that is conveniently vague, vague enough to be serving as a programmatic objective, no matter where the policies of NATO and the European Union be directed to. Basically, resilience is a concept that, thanks to its vagueness, enjoys a large degree of what I call constructive ambiguity. And thanks to its constructive ambiguity, the fact that the concept is vague enough for all member states to see something valuable there, that makes resilience a concept that enables consensus building. And since, the, since NATO and the European Union are increasingly divided alliances, concepts that enjoy this degree of constructive ambiguity like resilience become increasingly valuable as consensus building tools and ways to bridge this divide between the East and the South that I mentioned earlier. Now, I mentioned resilience as a, a bridging concept, a bridge between uh, expectations and reality, between and within policy communities, a bridge between recipients and uh, providers of reform, and a bridge between uh, increasingly divided uh, alliance and their member states. Uh, and all of this make it look like resilience is indeed a great idea. But of course, resilience has also been criticized a lot. The first criticism is that, of course, I mentioned it earlier, the fact that the concept is uh, vague might be politically expedient, but it also prob is problematic. Maybe the concept is in fact too vague and too ambiguous to be truly constructed. Also, this is part of an academic discussion that also has policy implications. The 
uh, criticism of some is that resilience is nothing but old wine in new bottles. We call resilience projection objectives and policies that we have in fact tried to pursue already for decades. Nothing has changed other than the label we call them with. In this case, resilience as opposed to stability, as opposed to uh, democracy promotion, and a lot of other uh, programmatic catchwords that have been used over the years. A third type of criticism is that resilience is a morally problematic concept. You remember when I said that resilience serve as a bridge between expectations and reality, I mentioned the growing awareness that in fact, the European Union and NATO members lack the capabilities to truly engage into ambitious reforms of countries in the global south. According to some, this may indeed be a form of uh, humility, a way to give up the patronizing mindset that often uh, uh, make uh, European countries, although well-intentioned, uh, barely tolerated uh, when dealing with countries in the developing world. But according to others, this is also a very convenient way to wash our hands of any responsibility for whatever happens in the global south. So it is a way for uh, the United States, for the European Union, and uh, each European Union member state to use this uh, belief that, in fact, reforming third countries is impossible to give up trying any reform in the first place. And some scholars go even further in this criticism, arguing that resilience is a neoliberal concept. It is a neoliberal concept because, according to these scholars, resilience is, in fact, nothing but a form of natural selection. Societies adapt to external shocks by changing. And this change, of course, without any form of external support, can only occur through a form of natural selection. So it is only a form of survival of the fittest. Resilience, according to scholars, mainly from the Marxist tradition, but not only, is a concept that only betrays the idea that this world is a world where the only applicable principle is the survival of the fittest. It is only the fittest that can adapt, and it is only through adaptation to external shocks that uh, we can, uh, in fact, survive the crisis that this world is posing. But if resilience is nothing but this, then isn't it a way to once again give up responsibility and um, shape, reshape society according to neoliberal principles? This is one of the criticisms that has been formulated, among others, by scholars like Chandler. I do not necessarily agree with uh, this criticism as such. Neither the idea that resilience is a concept that is intrinsically imbued with uh, neoliberal governmentality thinking, nor the idea that the concept is necessarily all wine in bottles or a way to give up responsibility. But I do believe that in order to, for resilience to be turned into a truly viable concept, we need to seriously engage both as scholars and as practitioners into an effort to answer some key questions that the existing definitions that I mentioned earlier still leave unanswered. And those are, just to mention some, how resilience is to be measured and subsequently to be promoted. Resilience to what? Against which do we have to be resilient? And last, resilience for whom? Let me conclude by trying to answer these questions. It would have been nice to have a debate together, but perhaps some of you will get back to me after this lecture and I would be happy to engage in further discussion. Let me start from how to promote resilience. This is a problem that many concepts in the social sciences suffer from. Resilience is a highly abstract concept. And as such, it is not something that we can see. How can we see whether a certain country, whether a certain society, whether a certain individual is resilient before it is too late. Because of course, we can 
see whether resilience is in place after a shock has occurred. We can uh, infer that if someone, if a society, if a state has successfully withstood a shock, then it has proven to be resilient. But of course, our foreign policy agendas have to be proactive rather than merely reactive. We need to anticipate whether a certain country is too fragile to withstand a certain shock in order to help those societies to be, build the resilience in the first place so that when a certain shock occurs, they will be ready to cope with it. There have been different efforts to try and make the concept of resilience a little uh, less vague and a little more easily operationalizable. One of them is to consider resilience as the exact opposite of fragility. Because fragility is a concept that has been out there for quite a while within the international relation community, and some indicators have been developed. There, have, there are, for instance, some fragility index that you can find online, and maybe we can use those uh, indicators as uh, something that guides us into the building of resilience itself. Another intuition that some scholars have played with is that resilience, the key ingredient to resilience, is not material factors. Of course, factors like uh, safe energy supplies or a certain uh, level of GDP that ensures that a certain country does not run out of food stock, that can provide uh, affordable health care for everybody. All of these are surely viable indicators for resilience. But what really matters in order for a society and a state to successfully resist external shock, that's a non-material factor social capital, the ability for members of a society to trust each other and to trust their decision makers. Without social capital, shocks will become unmanageable. Members of society will not trust their governments and therefore may easily fall prey to disinformation efforts, may easily uh, decide to uh, secede from their mother country. They may easily decide to engage in forms of behavior that are detrimental to solving crisis in the first place. And as such, social capital is really what we're looking for when it comes to dealing with resilience. But of course, building social capital is something that takes a long cultural change. Italy too is a country that is often criticized as not having sufficient social capital. Consider countries in the global south where that have suffered from authoritarian rule for decades. It would take decades after a democratic transition for those societies to finally learn to trust their governments again. So if social capital is the holy grail for resilience building, it is definitely not something that can be reasonably achieved within a short time frame. But last, the question of how to promote resilience is in turn depending on another question, and that is what type of shocks are we talking about? The extent to which a society is resilient depends on what types of shocks we're talking about. Maybe a society can be remarkably resilient to shocks like, say, a military invasion, but in fact be ill-equipped to tackle uh, different forms of uh, crisis like, uh, for instance, a pandemic disease. So let us see, let us think about what types of external shock are we really talking about when talking about resilience and therefore about resilience to what? From the documents that I showed you, you might have already got the impression that uh, NATO and to a lesser extent the European Union largely see resilience as preparedness against external shocks. Resilience is basically something that we need in order to make sure that we're ready when a shock comes from abroad, comes from outside of our borders into our societies. Those shocks could be energy disruptions, could be cyber attacks, could be unregulated migratory flows, could be the influx of foreign fighters into our territory, but they are external. They're the source of the machinations of some external adversary. Obviously, once again, the COVID-19 crisis shows this better than anything else. This is not necessarily the case. 
sometimes the shocks, or maybe oftentimes, the shocks that we're talking about are shocks that are not really the outcome of some hostile intentions. There's something that is primarily internal, that is already present in our societies. This is especially the case for countries at the southern borders of the European Union. Perhaps it is not external shocks that threaten the resilience of those countries. Perhaps the main factors that make those countries fragile are chronic underdevelopment, environmental degradation, but also instability and internal strife. The fact that we are talking about sectarian, ethnically divided, religiously divided societies that are often under authoritarian rule, well, obviously, that is a source of internal fragility that prevents those countries from being able to exercise any resilience. So, in order to know what we need to do in order to build resilience, we really need to answer this question. Resilience to what? Is resilience something that is mainly aimed, as it has been so far, at preparing states from dealing with external shocks by, for instance, training their military forces and making them more effective? Or is it something that should be mainly achieved through socioeconomic development and through efforts that are aimed at tackling internal sources of fragility? Let me elaborate further on this by moving on to the third question, and that is resilience for women. You may have probably already come across the idea that threats are socially constructed. What we see as a threat depends on our very culture, on our very identity. What some actors could see as a threat might in fact be not a threat at all to others because the way we see and make sense of the world cannot be disentangled from who we are. To some extent, this is also applicable to shocks. And I think that the example of migration makes it very clear. You probably came across the say that someone's terrorist is someone else's freedom fighter. Well, the same can be said about resilience. Maybe what is a shock to someone is in fact someone else's adaptation strategy. Migration is a case in point. Europeans have seen irregular migration. You remember how migration has been mentioned in some of the documents that I cited earlier. Europeans tend to see irregular migration on a large scale as a threat to the resilience of their democracies. I, I do not mean to enter into a debate here. It, it is, in fact, uh, uh, true, at least to some extent, that uh, the so-called migration crisis has brought about greater distrust into state institutions, has brought about the rise of populism. In a way, it has been uh, a, a challenge for resilience. But it is also true that that very challenge for resilience, the possibility for communities to migrate across borders, is also a way for those communities to cope with external shocks, such as poverty and unrest. The possibility for countries, for people within countries in uh, the southern and eastern neighborhood of the European Union, such as Syria, for instance, to migrate across countries while the civil war was taking place, has been a way for those very communities to adapt to such shocks and survive. So someone's shocks is in fact someone else's adaptation strategy. Once again, the question of resilience to what emerges in all its uh, dilemmas. As a follow up to this, let me continue and conclude with the last question, and that is resilience for whom? As you remember, the targets of resilience in uh, both NATO and even more so in European Union documents are manifold. The European Union, for instance, seeks to simultaneously promote resilience of individuals, households, societies, and states. And of course, this makes sense. Promoting the resilience of each of these targets is something that is definitely worth doing. But the question is then, can all of these goals really be all promoted simultaneously? Do they all go hand in hand? As an example of how there could be a trade-off between different targets of resilience, let me tell you about one of the main policy tools for projecting resilience that NATO and the European Union have been doing. 
capacity building missions. Missions like, for instance, the reform of the security sector of a certain country, the training of their military. For instance, consider the training missions that NATO has been uh, uh, offering to members of the Egyptian military within the Mediterranean dialogue. Or consider the training of the Libyan Coast Guard that uh, the European Union Common Security and Defense uh, Policy Mission, UNAFOR Med Sophia, has been pursuing. In a way, this uh, mission certainly uh, strengthened the ability of states to cope with uh, external challenges. And as such, they may certainly strengthen state resilience. But if we are strengthening the security sector of an authoritarian country, we're also in danger of engaging, although inadvertently, into policies that may threaten the long-term resilience of societies. We're engaging in policies that may threaten the democratization of those societies and socioeconomic inclusions. I do not need to tell you that oftentimes the military and the broader security sector are being used by authoritarian governments as a tool for uh, repressing domestic dissent. So here you can see an old dilemma under the carpet. The turn to resilience has perhaps hid, but not necessarily solved. The old vex question of whether we should have democracy promotion as uh, the cornerstone of our foreign policies, or in fact, whether we should settle for more modest goals like stabilization. Here perhaps is the answer to the question that I asked you at the beginning, why the European Union removed the notion of stability from its uh, programmatic documents like the global strategy. Stability and stabilization implicitly means that we're going to live with authoritarian governments. But on the other hand, the appetite for democratization and the very belief that democratization efforts would work out has faded away over the last few years. So perhaps resilience serves as a middle ground that might ensure that a modicum of consent still exists on what we're going to do. But in fact, resilience and the turn to resilience has not solved the dilemma. Should we promote democracy or should we settle for stability? There is no clear cut, one size fits all question, and this question still remains an answer. I will conclude on this note, and I would really encourage you to ask questions. I hope that this lecture was uh, interesting enough. I'm sorry that I could not make it any more interactive. Unfortunately, I, it had to be recorded, but I hope that there will be the possibility to meet and discuss in person one day. Thank you so much. Take care.